order. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the second televised um, committee of the legislature from this room. And going forward, all committee meetings now will be televised. Um, so if you tune in to the Nova Scotia uh, legislature site, you can live stream it and um, spread the word. Um, we, I welcome you here to the Standing Committee on Natural Resources and Economic Development. My name is Suzanne Lonis Croft. I am the chair of this committee and the member from Lunenburg. Uh, the committee will be receiving presentations from various representatives, the Department of Energy and Mines, the Department of Environment, Efficiency <laughs> Nova Scotia, and the Town of Bridgewater. I ask committee members to introduce themselves by stating their name and constituency, starting with Ms. Chender. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Claudia Chender, MLA for Dartmouth South. Good morning, welcome, or good afternoon, welcome. <laughs> I spent the morning here too. Uh, Lisa Roberts, MLA for Halifax Need. I'm glad to see you. Good afternoon, Elizabeth Smith McCrossan from Cumberland North. Uh, Pat Dunn, Picture Center. Welcome, Hugh McKay from beautiful Chester St. Margaret's. Good day, folks. I'm Ben Jessam representing Hammonds Plains of Lucasville, and today I'm filling in for Keith Irving from King South. Hi, Patricia Arab, MLA for the energetic Fairview Clayton Park, and uh, subbing in for Rafa de Costanzo from Clayton Park West. And our clerk is uh, Ms. Darlene Henry, and our ledge counsel, Mr. Gordon Hebb. I would like to remind people to turn off their phones or put them on vibrate. Uh, there's no photography allowed in this room, uh, with the exception of the media. Um, should you need coffee or tea or washrooms, the door to your, to your left going out, um, you can be accommodated. And should there be an emergency, we will exit um, through Granville Street and meet up at the Grand Parade Square. <clears throat> Members uh, and witnesses, please wait to be recognized by me, the chair, so that your microphone can be turned on appropriately and, and for recording purposes. Uh, we welcome our witnesses today, and we ask them to introduce themselves uh, before the presentation, starting with Ms. Rondeau. I think I'm okay. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Nancy Rondo. I'm the Director of Energy Efficiency, Energy Efficiency and Sustainable Energy at the Department of Energy and Mines. Simon Dantremont, the Deputy Minister at Energy and Mines. Francis Martin, Deputy Minister at uh, Nova Scotia Environment. Good afternoon. I'm Steve McDonald. I'm the CEO of Efficiency One, Efficiency Nova Scotia. Good afternoon. I'm Leon DeVried. I'm the Sustainability Planner for the Town of Bridgewater. And so, Mr. DeVry, I understand you have a presentation to do, so we'll begin with you, and uh, I think you'll be using the screen behind me. I have a screen in front of me. So, Mr. DeVry. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you for um, welcoming the Town of Bridgewater to meet with you today. We are honored by that privilege and hope that we have something to share for the benefit of the province. Um, so as I said, my name is Leon DeVried, and I am the project lead on the Energize Bridgewater program a program that has been uh, around 10 years in the making. Um, you have a copy of my presentation, or at least I, I've uh, provided them to Ms. Darlene, um, and uh, you can follow along my slides there. Um, so Bridgewater's program uh, has become nationally recognized. In 2019, Bridgewater was the winner of the Smart Cities Challenge in the Small Communities category, winning over 49 other applicants. The win has brought Nova Scotian innovation onto the national and international spotlight. This graph illustrates where our community started with this work. In 2018, Bridgewater Town Council approved a 30-year plan to fundamentally shift our community's energy infrastructure toward a clean, <coughs> efficient, secure, and affordable energy system. Our town has one of the most advanced community energy transition plans in North America. We have been working diligently to achieve this future energy economy, a goal that is widely supported by our community and regional partners, including 
Uh, several of the other presenters who are with me here today, we have been working with their departments and staff on this initiative, and without whose commitment and support, much of this progress would not have been possible. I also want to add a dimension to this conversation that doesn't often get mentioned, the relationship between energy cost and poverty. Bridgewater has an aging housing stock that is desperately in need of renewal, as do many Nova Scotian communities. Our research has demonstrated that energy poverty has reached epidemic levels in our community. Bridgewater's program creates a unique and powerful symbiosis of reducing greenhouse gas emissions while driving down one of the leading causes of poverty in Nova Scotia, the high proportion of family income spent on keeping our homes warm and affording basic transportation needs. Regional research from a number of sources is confirming that energy poverty is rampant throughout Atlantic Canada. This screenshot from energypoverty.ca demonstrates the need for systemic interventions to address this growing problem. We are very much aware that Bridgewater's energy solutions have not just local but also regional relevance and impact. The colors indicate the degree to which energy poverty is experienced by uh, residents in those, in those jurisdictions, and I, I believe that uh, those are approximately by county or, or close to it. Uh, the darker blue, the color, the more uh, pervasive energy poverty rates are in those communities. And I think that uh, for the darkest blue, they're somewhere around uh, 40 to 50 percent. So very, very high uh, figures. The website is extremely informative. I encourage you to have a look. If you haven't, yeah. So Bridgewater's innovations that are being recognized through smart cities and other uh, programs include creating local affordable deep energy improvements for homes, developing mechanisms for community scale, clean and affordable energy systems, improved transit and active transportation infrastructure, local investment platforms for energy initiatives, and coordinated access for at-risk residents to receive the services that they need. To implement these solutions, the town is working closely with my co-presenters in the room, as well as with a wide coalition of local, provincial, and national partners. Partners from across the public, private, and non-profit sectors are heavily involved with our work. Should we be successful, the Energize Bridgewater program intends to fully demonstrate measurable benefits to our community and region, including reduced poverty and improved well-being, better housing, increased mobility, more effective community services, increased economic access and participation, achieved climate targets, and investment in underfunded neighborhoods. Innovative use of smart cities technologies enables us to measure and report on progress, as well as improve our programs and services to increase our reach and our positive impact. Now, on to the topic at hand. Bridgewater's vision for environmental sustainability and poverty reduction is also founded on a sound theory of economic development based on supporting local trades to do local work. Our research shows that this work creates high quality local jobs, white collar as well as blue collar. The economic impact of the work supports many dimensions of local economic development, including millions invested in clean energy products and trades work, better living conditions for residents, which results in increased economic participation, business investment in energy upgrades and technologies, direct income earned from investment in community energy projects, and growing the local knowledge economy, in particular around smart technologies and best practices. Driving this economic growth is direct investment into energy efficiency and community scale clean energy systems with a measurable and predictable return on investment as calculated in the town's community energy investment plan. We are projecting as much as $32 million in local infrastructure and energy investment by 2025 and 10 times that by 2050. Research on associated job growth points to a net growth of thousands of person years of employment 
in the green collar economy resulting from this work. And this is just from the work that is to take place in Bridgewater. Key to all of this is de-risking public and private investment in community-based clean energy solutions. There is an unprecedented opportunity in Nova Scotia to drive climate action, economic growth, and poverty reduction through this investment. Municipalities want to work with the province to support green sector job creation. Bridgewater is keen to work with our provincial partners to increase the flow of investment dollars into local communities through a number of de-risking activities. And I won't go through them in detail for you, but I'm happy to speak to them in the interest of knowing that my time is limited. But they include enhanced funding and partnerships for the initiatives that I've described, the creation of local energy investment platforms, including the maintenance of the CDF equity tax credit program, which we see as a valuable solution in this mix. Support for increased municipal investment directly into these energy solutions by expanding the role of municipalities in the ability to issue PACE financing and other uh, financing uh, solutions and boosting trade sector capacity to take on the necessary work. I just want to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today, and I would be happy to answer questions on any aspect of our work. Thank you, Mr. DeVries. Um, Mr. Dantemont, do you have opening remarks? I do, thank you very much. Welcome and thanks for uh, inviting us here today. Uh, it's a great opportunity for us to uh, discuss some little known facts about the Department of Energy and Mines. Uh, one of the main roles of the Department of Energy and Mines is to invest in energy efficiency and clean energy to reduce emissions and help create new jobs and grow Nova Scotia's green economy. This is an area where Nova Scotia is having a significant amount of success. Nova Scotia is a national leader in fighting climate change by reducing emissions. Over the next three years, we're investing nearly $120 million in programs that reduce emissions even further while creating jobs in the green economy. We're investing $25 million in energy efficiency upgrades that will improve 2,400 Mi'kmaq homes and 11,500 uh, units for public housing. Our work with low-income homeowners, sustainable transportation and solar energy will continue uh, into the future. Some of our notable achievements include 16,000 low-income Nova Scotians have had free energy efficiency upgrades since 2007. More than 120,000 homes in Nova Scotia have been installed an energy-saving heat pump. More than 3, 000, uh, sorry, 300 businesses and uh, 1,400 people now work in the energy efficiency industry. Energy efficiency avoids more than 1 million tons of carbon emissions every year. And we wouldn't be in this position uh, without the hard work and dedication of the people who deliver the programs like Stephen McDonald and the great folks at Efficiency Nova Scotia. Stephen's organization also helps us deliver the Solar Homes program and more than 600 families have now added solar electricity to their homes. More than 70 community organizations have been approved to add solar panels to their buildings and can sell electricity to their utility. When we started the Solar Homes program last year, there were 13 approved installers in the province. Today, we have more than 60. Those are hundreds of new jobs. No one in Atlantic Canada uh, has installed more wind energy than Nova Scotia, and our renewable energy use has more than tripled over the last 10 years. We're also helping train workers to become certified energy managers and installers. We're, we've also supported municipalities to offer low-cost financing through PACE, that's a Property Assessed Clean Energy Financing. This allows homeowners to finance retrofits on their property tax bills. Plus, we've been able to do this while keeping electricity rates stable uh, on to 2022. The work that went into developing the industry over the last decade has positioned Nova Scotia very well. Uh, other provinces and countries are, are looking to set up similar programs as in Nova Scotia. Increasingly, we're seeing more and more communities coming forward with innovative ideas to join the fight against climate change and to ensure more people benefit from our transition to a cleaner energy future. And Bridgewater, who's here with us today, is a fantastic uh, example of, of leadership in the province. Whether it's solar gardens, district heating, or any other emission-reducing project, my department is looking at what we can do to help. I welcome an opportunity to discuss these matters uh, further and, and look forward to your questions. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Dontremont. We will begin our questionings. We'll start with the PC caucus with Mr. Dunn. Uh, I thank oh, you. Sorry, sorry. I think Mr. McDonald had a presentation. Did you? I'm sorry. <laughs> Mr. McDonald. We'll get you. So. <laughs> thank you. I have some opening uh, remarks to make, and I think members of the committee uh, may have a copy of them, but. Um, and, I, and I'd like to um, introduce them as well. So as I mentioned, my name is Stephen McDonald. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Efficiency One. <laughs> Efficiency One is the independent administrator of Efficiency Nova Scotia. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you today about our work and the growth of green jobs in the province. So at Efficiency Nova Scotia, we design, market, evaluate, and measure the impact of efficiency programs. These programs encourage the adoption of energy efficient technologies and practices by providing education and information, financial incentives, and expert advice. But the actual technology and services, the building design, insulation, heating and cooling equipment, that's supplied by a growing energy efficiency industry in this province. And so today, there are over 1,400 people employed directly in the energy efficiency sector. There's more than 340 companies have joined our efficiency trade network, and that number has, has more than doubled since 2017, and approximately 45% of these businesses are located outside of Halifax. Efficiency Canada recently released a provincial scorecard, and Nova Scotia ranked uh, fourth overall uh, and first in the efficiency programs category. The scorecard noted that one of the province's strengths is training and professionalization, and that Nova Scotia has more energy advisors per building and certified energy managers per business than any other province. And the efficiency industry here in this province uh, is producing results. So more than $1 billion has been saved in energy costs. Uh, over a million tons of CO2 is being avoided because of energy efficiency, avoided annually, and up to a 50% reduction in heating costs for low-income homeowners. Efficiency Canada also noted that Nova Scotia's trained workforce demonstrates the growth of the province efficiency industry and the capability to save even more energy. And jobs, jobs grow alongside energy savings. And so Dunsky Energy Consulting modeled the net economic impacts of energy efficiency measures that are contained in the Pancanaan Framework for Clean Growth and Climate Change. The report concluded that implementing these measures will lead to a net increase of 4,200 jobs in an average year in Nova Scotia and increase provincial GDP by nearly $8 billion by 2030. While most of the employment impact is in sectors associated with implementing energy efficiency programs such as construction, manufacturing and retail wholesale trade, as energy savings accumulate, increased demand for local goods and services increases economic output and jobs more broadly. Taking bold action on energy efficiency will create more jobs and economic opportunity for Nova Scotia. The Dunsky report estimated that every $1 spent on efficiency programs generates $7 in GDP. The province has set a bold goal in the Sustainable Development Goals Act to achieve net zero by 2050. Energy efficiency must play a key role in this transition. It is generally regarded as one of the most cost-effective tools any jurisdiction can use in reducing greenhouse gas emissions, in addition to the economic and employment benefits I've just outlined. And the province's continued investment, support, and commitment to energy efficiency is proof of that. But there's another reason why energy efficiency should be at the center of this transition, and that's because Nova Scotians are embracing it, and they want more of it. More than 400,000 program participants have completed energy efficiency projects. There are over 300,000 visitors to the Efficiency Nova Scotia website each year and 20,000 subscribers to regular Efficiency Nova Scotia communications. Our research shows that a significant majority of Nova Scotians <coughs> consistently assign a high level of importance to reducing their energy use. And what's more, a significant majority of Nova Scotians express a high level of agreement that adopting more energy efficient lifestyle adds to their quality of life. We have seen growth in new programs such as solar homes and programs such as the Mi'kmaq Home Energy Efficiency Project are also expected to lead to additional job creation, specifically in the 13 Mi'kmaq communities, as the program has a mandate 
to work with community preferred contractors wherever possible. In Nova Scotia, we have a robust energy efficient market knowledge, expertise, and industry capacity. We have a well-developed network of trade partners and strong public awareness of and demand for energy efficiency programs and services. The people, companies, and know-how are ready and eager to contribute to Nova Scotia's economic and environmental prosperity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McDonald. And I understand, Ms. Martin, you have opening remarks as well. So um, go ahead, Ms. Martin. Thank you very much. Um, uh, welcome the uh, conversation and questions following, uh, but uh, wanted to highlight a few things that are, are happening in um, my department's sphere, so thank you for that. Uh, people certainly understand today that uh, economic development and environmental <coughs> excuse me, protection go hand in hand. Internationally, uh, Greta Thunberg is a powerful voice uh, for that sort of change. But locally, uh, we can see that uh, commitment uh, from climate change protests this fall uh, helped influence uh, a variety of different decisions. Um, we have as well local uh, communities like Plastic 3, uh, Lunenburg, and, um, and uh, the Sobeys decision to eliminate plastic in their stores as um, examples of um, uh, local action here. Nova Scotians, uh, no times have changed, and uh, the way we live and work, shop and play, uh, has to change as well. My staff are certainly committed uh, to helping Nova Scotia move forward in this regard. Last October, we introduced the country's uh, most ambitious uh, greenhouse gas uh, reduction target as part of the government's Sustainable Goals and Development Act legislation. This legislation committed to Nova Scotia to reducing our greenhouse gas emissions by 53% below the 2005 levels of, uh, by 2030. Uh, government has also uh, committed um, to move to a net zero uh, carbon footprint by 2050, the first to have put that in legislation. It's uh, people and communities uh, that will get us there. The legis uh, legislation created a Sustainable Communities Challenge Fund as well, uh, and this was to support uh, innovation uh, on community projects to help fight uh, climate change, to create green jobs, and to grow the economy. A new uh, climate change strategy will be in place by the end of this year. Uh, and that is aimed at uh, reducing our greenhouse gas emissions and expanding Nova Scotia's green economy and creating green jobs. The Act, uh, uh, as designed, uh, set a bold new uh, direction for government. Nova Scotia is very well positioned as a leader in um, Canada's green economy. Uh, companies here are already leading the way and expanding to offer more in energy efficient home renovations and creating new products from recycled plastics. This will set the stage for more innovation as we work to meet our ambitious targets that we have set. Uh, we hope to consult on regulations uh, for this legislation and on the Green Fund uh, later this spring. Uh, we also have our sights set on the coastline. Uh, last year, Nova Scotia became the first province in Canada to pass legislation specifically aimed at helping the province uh, address the challenges of sea level rise and coastal erosion. Uh, this, of course, is brought on by the impacts of climate change. In addition to that, we're working with uh, municipalities, planners, engineers, and other professionals to develop regulations that will set out exactly how that act will work. Uh, this will give Nova Scotians the clarity on what can and can't uh, be uh, done near the coastline. And we want to encourage smart development that takes climate change into account. Uh, we're also working to give existing businesses an incentive to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, four years ago, the federal government told the provinces that they would be required to put a price on carbon. Uh, Ottawa said that if we did not um, voluntarily put a price on carbon that they would do it for us. Our climate change team developed a cap and trade system which gives companies the innovative advantage. They can sell unused credits to other businesses um, and in a system that um, also limits the cost to everyday Nova Scotians as much as possible. Last year Ottawa accepted our plan 
and as a result, Nova Scotians will be paying less out of pocket compared to residents in other provinces. I'm also proud uh, for some of the uh, quieter things that we've been doing in Nova Scotia related to our green economy. Each year, the Clean Foundation offers its highly successful clean leadership program. Last year, 73 smart, committed interns uh, worked on meaningful environmental projects uh, as clean leadership interns. This program allowed companies to attract smart new talent and help students gain experience as green leaders. So I'm excited to tell you that Clean has received over, excuse me, over 30% more applications from businesses this year compared to last. It's also worth uh, highlighting the solid waste sector. Nova Scotia uh, sends less than half the amount of waste to landfills uh, compared to other Canadians. Uh, our municipalities work hard uh, to expand their recycling programs and find markets <coughs> for those products. We've just uh, also introduced um, opportunity to recycle used oil as well as um, uh, glycol. Uh, Nova Scotians want us to lead in the new green economy, and they want us uh, to know that. Um, and they, they, excuse me, they want to know that their children and grandchildren can find meaningful work that will protect rather than harm the planet. We certainly believe that this work is important that we're doing uh, in our department in that regard. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Martin. Uh, we will now open up for questions, and we'll start with the PC caucus, Mr. Dunn. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and uh, a big thank you to all of you with the uh, involvement that you're presently in and uh, trying to meet the targets that are, that are out there. So uh, a big thanks for that. My, my first two questions are dealing with uh, conversations I had with um, uh, former uh, Northern Pulp employees that were in my constituency office. Um, with, with the closure of mine, Therefore, the loss of jobs and perhaps a, a rise in the unemployment. Uh, their question to me is: the government going to be uh, involved in, or will they, or how will they become involved in um, retraining some of these employees in the uh, green economy? Was one of the questions that they had, and, and I didn't have the information with me at the time, so I said, "I, I know exactly where I can ask the question." But uh, maybe maybe I'll leave it there. Who would like to take that, Mr. Dantua? Sure. Uh, I guess I can't speak broadly for the transition committee, uh, but certainly uh, we believe that the uh, green economy. Uh, there's going to be a significant amount of activity in that region. We've been talking to not independently of the transition committee, uh, with, no, with uh, the NSCC and looking at opportunities for training for uh, and developing new talent for the, for the green economy. We're going to need uh, a, a new host of solar installers and so on. So there's, we believe there's a great opportunity there. And every time <coughs> we have an opportunity to put that forward as an area for training opportunities and for career development, we do. Mr. Don, for a supplementary. There's, uh, I think there's approximately uh, 70, 70 employees just read from the town of New Glasgow, which is one of the parts of my constituency uh, that they, they've worked there. Um, another question that they had, they were they were talking about salaries. So uh, I would say 80% of the uh, the former employees that were in my office had they were university trained, and they were making 120, 130,000 annually. And their question was, you know. If there's uh, these types of uh, jobs available and the retraining is there, and we take the retraining, they were they were they were wanting to know the comparison uh, or with the jobs provide a salary somewhere close to what they have been making over the past few years. Mr. Dantremont, I would suggest those are questions best asked of labor and advanced education and maybe I believe uh, Ms. Kellyanne Dean, uh, who's chair of the transition committee, is coming at an upcoming meeting. I would suggest that would be uh, the appropriate place to, to get answers to those types of questions. 
And I'd just like to remind people the topic is programs and green jobs, and I understand two members of the of the transition team are here, but they're not here to, to speak on transition. Yours yours are sort of borderline, Mr. Dunn, so I'll excuse it as okay. Um, but what I would like to uh, remind you that Ms. Dean is coming in next week to speak to this committee. So we'll keep it to programs and green jobs because that's what our, our guests have come here to talk about. Um, going to the NDP caucus, Ms. Roberts. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for being here and particularly having um, heard about the experience in Bridgewater for years and even having, having spoken about it in the legislature a little bit based on what's available online. I'm, I'm excited to um, understand a little bit more. Um, Mr. DeVried, I, un I understand that a portion of Bridgewater's clean energy financing program operates through the through a PACE program. Um, and we, we hear that there are some challenges for other municipalities wanting to implement PACE programs. I wonder if you could just speak broadly to that. What are, um, what are the, the reasons that, that you identify yourself in your presentation that there's, needs, there's, there's a need for additional mechanisms for financing this sort of work? Mr. DeVries. Um, thank you. Thank you for the for the question. Um, if I may be permitted to move back to my slide that has a, a number of points on this. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, PACE, uh, Nova Scotia really has the most advanced PACE programs in the country at this time. Uh, the ability to, to finance home energy upgrades through um, uh, municipal uh, to re to finance them through the municipality and repay them on on municipal tax bills and charges um, is a, is a very innovative mechanism that is being looked at and and you know not a month goes by that I don't receive a call from municipalities across Canada looking for how this is done in Nova Scotia and what the benefits and impacts are the major challenge that we have identified in Bridgewater. Uh, having run the program now for approximately four years, is um, is the challenge of of stimulating sufficient uptake in the program. Um, we work closely with the Clean Foundation and with Efficiency Nova Scotia in um, in the in the design and in the implementation of the program and ensuring that it lines up with uh, you know uh, available incentives and so on. Um, at the end of the day. Um, what we have been discovering is that a standalone PACE program operated by a single municipality is, is, is challenged in getting the uptake from the community that, it, that, that, it, that might be possible under a larger kind of platform or umbrella. So uh, Bridgewater's approach to PACE is to expand its overall energy programming on the local level and to see PACE as one of several financing opportunities that residents can take advantage of because it's not a, 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 a panache, you know, type of, a, it's not the solution for every homeowner or every property owner in the community, but it has tremendous potential uh, because municipalities have the ability to offer financing at a fixed lending at a fixed rate of interest, say for 10 or even 15 years, which they can't get from a, from a bank, from a, a traditional lending institution. And there's other benefits as well. Um, our rollout of the program is really about applying PACE on a neighborhood scale so that we look at entire neighborhoods in the community, we build an economy of scale in implementing upgrades, and we build a, a social marketing component into that as well. So that is, that is the future for PACE in Bridgewater. Um, I have, we, uh, my colleagues and I have identified a number of specific challenges to the PACE program as well. And uh, those, uh, those recommendations stemming from that are, are located on, your, on the screen right now or on your handout. Um, the first is that municipalities only have the ability to borrow from municipal finance corporation. And um, there are actually other lenders in the marketplace that would be very willing to lend to municipalities for the purposes of PACE financing at much lower interest rates than what municipal finance corporation is able to lend at. In fact, there is a global industry seeking to achieve high impact 
lending for energy transition that is really unable to find a foothold in Nova Scotia uh, because of the, these types of barriers. Um, there is literally trillions of dollars in international investment looking for high impact investment opportunities. We believe that municipalities are at the forefront of being able to utilize this type of investment dollars. One of the challenges, again, is municipalities are not able to borrow from private or nonprofit sources. Uh, we believe that these, these opportunities exist. The second is that um, municipalities' ability to borrow PACE funds is limited by the calculation of our debt service coverage ratio, or DSCR. And uh, because, we, because uh, the, the province looks at our financial indicators, and if we borrow to lend to homeowners on PACE, um, that affects our debt service coverage ratio in a negative way. And we believe that PACE should actually be excluded from the calculation of the debt service coverage ratio. I think there's a very sound argument for that uh, to take place. We've been in discussions with our provincial colleagues uh, for a number of years on that. We're hoping for an opportunity to break through that, that challenge. Uh, that would significantly expand the uh, borrowing limit for municipalities to issue PACE financing without putting our, other, our ability to finance other infrastructure at risk. Uh, which is the major challenge that we face. And finally, um, we believe that there are other very specific provincial tools that can be put in place to de-risk municipal lending through PACE. One example would be a revolving PACE loan fund, uh, whereby the dollars are, say, lended by the province to the municipalities and then returned to the province, thereby not putting our own um, uh, uh, borrowed funds at risk. And another opportunity is to institute a loan guarantee program of some kind that would further de-risk these types of loans. We believe that they are generally very secure loans because they are tied to the property uh, to which they are um, attached. And so there's very little risk even of, 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 of default in a well-structured PACE program. Ms. Roberts for a supplementary. Uh, thank you very much for that answer. And I think it, it gives us a sense of, um, you know, where we are and, and how we could accelerate in a way that is um, in line with the urgency of the actual situation. And, and I, again, I'm, I'm really excited to have you here and to have more, um, more of us and hopefully more, more Nova Scotians, thanks to this committee being televised, understanding some of the, the really great innovative work that's happening. Um, can you, uh, you know, we have, we have goals uh, for greenhouse gas uh, reduction targets. Um, under the new Sustainable um, Sustainable Development Goals Act, we know that, you know, aiming uh, for net zero um, by 2050 is, you know, according to scientists, uh, too late, um, and 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 we we have to we have to all be so ambitious. Um, if if the financing and other any other barriers were able to be um, addressed, so that um, you know, deep energy retrofits on existing building stock could be pursued um, at a systemic, strategic, you know, uh, aggressive, aggressive manner, um, neighborhood by neighborhood. What uh, what is the potential for greenhouse gas uh, reduction um, achievements there? Who is who for? Is? I'm sorry, that is for Mr. Devried. Mr. Devried. So. Um, I don't, I don't have kiloton uh, type information for you. We did calculate this in our community energy investment plan, uh, which is freely downloadable from our website at energizebridgewater.ca. Uh, what I can say is that we applied a range of measures in that plan that are all available off the shelf today. So using existing technology in, uh, in uh, building sector uh, energy efficiency, uh, community scale renewable energy technologies, energy storage, and so on, uh, we didn't, you know, we didn't apply fusion power to this calculation, and we essentially calculated that Bridgewater, as a community, minus some challenges in getting our industrial sector. Uh, to be net zero, but we essentially calculated that by 2050, Bridgewater as a community, as a fairly average Atlantic Canadian town, can become essentially net zero. So 
that is that a, a, a complete elimination of, of carbon emissions from the community is technically feasible, and we believe it is economically feasible as well. Not just feasible, but beneficial. Thank you. We'll move on to the Liberal Caucus. Mr. McKay. Thank you, Chair. Um, again, thank you all for being here today. Um, certainly in your uh, preambles there were some very notable figures uh, being coming out. Uh, numbers of jobs that can be created, um, uh, and alarmingly, the, um, uh, the energy poverty in the province. I had no idea that it was so severe. Uh, but I'll come back to that. Um, Mr. McDonald, you mentioned the Efficiency Canada Provincial Scoreboard, and uh, uh, Canada and Nova Scotia seems to have placed fairly well in that. Uh, I had a short tutorial on it yesterday, uh, courtesy of uh, some friends, and um, one of the things that it seemed to be noting uh, that we could do a better job at is, uh, is with our buildings, with our building footprints, uh, and ret retrofits in particular. And I was wondering, do we have any plans, any strategy that uh, will move Nova Scotia forward in that area? Mr. McDonald? Thank you. So I think um, in the Efficiency Canada scorecard rankings, um, so the scorecard itself looks at a number of different different areas. So policies that are in place at a provincial level, the types of programs that are in place, the capacity of the workforce to actually do the work, financing mechanisms like PACE uh, programs and, and whatnot. And, um, and so where Nova Scotia ranked uh, uh, at the top of the list was on programs. So the breadth of programs that are available based on, you know, sector, income levels, um, different parts of the community, whether you're a renter or homeowner, uh, the province ranks very high in terms of comprehensive coverage. Uh, where, the, where the report said the province could go a little further is around uh, policies around building codes, for example. And so um, I know there is some efforts underway, and um, my colleagues at Department of Energy might be better uh, placed to answer this question, but um, around looking at a step code, uh, modeling what's happening in uh, BC, trying to really push the envelope in terms of energy efficiency. Um, I, I would just comment uh, related to this around uh, deep, the concept of deep retrofits. So it came up in the earlier question. Um, th that's a very, very important concept. So when we talk about deep retrofits, generally what we're speaking about are retrofits uh, to, a, to a building that save more than 50% of the energy uh, of that building. And so uh, if we're looking at moving the province to a net zero scenario by 2050, um, we really need to pursue deep retrofits. And deep retrofits are enabled by, uh, uh, one, having the skilled workforce, uh, part of what we're talking about today, to do the work, right? So uh, across the spectrum, uh, design is a huge part of deep retrofits, ensuring that you have the you know, specially trained individuals to do the design work, uh, whether it's contractors, insulation, HVAC contractors ac across the board. But you also need to have access to financing. And so um, the money to be able to, to pay for the retrofits, because of course en investments in energy efficiency take place generally at one time at the beginning. You do the retrofits and you, you know, the payback comes over time. And so having a mix of incentives, like what's offered through Efficiency Nova Scotia, plus financing options through a PACE type financing or other low interest loans. There's been some talk at the federal level about providing up to $40,000 in interest-free loans to homeowners. That's all part of the mix that's required in order to really hit those deep, deep energy savings. Mr. McKay for your supplementary. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I mentioned the uh, startling figures on, on uh, energy poverty. Uh, and uh, Representing a, a rural riding, uh, I know that there is certainly many cases of uh, energy poverty in my riding. Uh, I'm wondering if there are any suggestions you could make as to what an MLA can do to try to help address this. Mr. Dontremont. I can start off and maybe some others can, can jump in. So uh, I don't have the numbers right at my fingertips, but it is true if you look at a national scale of energy poverty. Unfortunately, the Atlantic region uh, is above the, the national average in terms of people who have a large proportion of their income dedicated to, uh, to energy needs. Uh, <laughs> uh, so for that reason, we in the department, we're providing to efficiency about $12 million a year for the home warming program. And uh, Stephen can provide more detail of the delivery, but basically it's providing free assessments and uh, implementation 
uh, of energy efficiency upgrades, the average savings, I believe, is around $950 per, uh, per homeowner. And this is offered to low-income Nova Scotians. Uh, interestingly enough, with my senior's portfolio hat, I also know that about uh, 60 to 70% of this is going to seniors. So uh, it is an opportunity that while you know, our electricity rates may be high, <coughs> our, our rates can be high, but your bills can be low if you invest strategically in making the difference between what the rates are and what your actual bill is by consuming less. So. Okay, thank you. We'll turn it over to the PC Caucus, Ms. Smith McCrossan. All right, thank you for all for your presentations and congratulations on your ranking and top in the country with your programs. Um, it's interesting that we still rank third highest in energy poverty, and I'm, I'm sure it's linked partly to that we, I believe we have the second highest electricity rates in the country, so there's probably a relationship there. I'm wondering um, what, if you could speak to what Efficiency One may have um, with respects to helping commercial enterprises and businesses, either with their commercial buildings or their businesses to create energy efficiencies. Um, because looking at energy poverty, I'm sure part of it is reflective of our, of our economy. So if we can help our businesses to be more uh, efficient and find savings, that may be beneficial. And tied into that, I'm wondering if, especially with respect to what's happened recently within our forestry industry, if you would consider or are looking at wood energy to be, to be part of Energy One programs, with, with projects such as like district heating systems and that for either towns or large um, industry. Mr. McDonald. Thank you. Um, thanks for the question. Um, businesses, commercial enterprises, small businesses, um, institutions um, uh, can really benefit from energy efficiency. And so, yes, we do have a number of programs that are available to businesses. Um, one of the... Um, before I get into the programs, one of the important uh, things I want to note is the productivity and competitiveness benefit that businesses gain from becoming more energy efficient. We know that many businesses and institutions, uh, their energy costs are a significant part of their overall cost base, if you will. And whenever you become more energy efficient, of course, you're getting the same or more output for less input. And so uh, it makes our businesses more productive and competitive, and so which I think is a very important thing. So um, we have programs uh, for businesses of all types, um, small businesses. We have programs to help small businesses um, receive rebates on heating and cooling equipment, refrigeration equipment, um, pumping, uh, commercial equipment. Um, generally, one of the um, we have a number of avenues for how businesses would access our programs. Access our programs. Uh, they can receive uh, rebates at the point of purchase through wholesalers and distributors. Uh, we have a program, uh, we call it our custom program, and essentially it's um, for larger users of electricity, so you know, roughly over 350,000 kilowatt hour usage per year. Um, we provide uh, specialized services to them. And so we may fund a scoping study, uh, we may provide incentives to help them build a building or reduce energy use in a manufacturing process. Um, uh, really try and design that program such that it's tailored to the individual business unit. Um, the, other, the other part of our programs, um, although they may not be tailored to businesses, would be for nonprofit organizations. And uh, nonprofit organizations, of course, uh, serve an important community service in many cases. We have programs uh, for nonprofit organizations, and so in many cases they're delivering a service in the community, and so we have programs tailored to them. Um, second part of your question around the forestry uh, side and uh, wood energy. And so on the residential side, we do have a program. Uh, it's called Green Heat, and we provide incentives for um, customers who want to adopt um, wood heating or wood pellets. And so roughly an incentive of about um, three to $400 uh, per wood stove. Um, uptake on that is uh, fairly modest. Uh, we have been involved in some larger projects uh, that involve district heating, district energy. Um, I, I can't say off the top of my head whether or not those have involved any biomass or wood burning, uh, but I can look into that and follow up with the committee. So, thank you. Ms. Smith McCrossan. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. I know um, I'm, I'm glad to hear that you're open to that, that you have the green heat program and that you'd be open to looking at 
maybe larger scale projects using wood. Uh, I know up in Cumberland County alone, we were um, shipping 100,000 tons of pulp and fiber that now our foresters, our harvesters are looking at not having a market for. So we're exploring um, all kinds of options of how we could be using that. And I know that solar is sexy, for lack of a better word, in the, the last year, and there's all kinds of grants and funding available, but wood is a renewable resource, and we have it right here in Nova Scotia. And so anything that your um, organization can do to develop programs so that we could use our own renewable resource in Nova Scotia, I know would be very beneficial to to our local uh, foresters. And I don't know if anyone else in the panel would like to speak speak to that or not, or if, if be curious to know if Bridgewater, is that included in your overall strategy as well? Mr. DeVries? Yeah, uh, yes, thank you for the question. Um, so Bridgewater has modeled a, a, a district energy system for its community. Um, the economics of district energy for a town of our size are tenuous at this point, but may improve over time as energy costs, base energy costs continue to rise, and potentially with the development of partnerships or programs supported by other levels of government, that may be possible. We, in fact, as part of our community energy investment plan, modeled a wood heat-based district energy system. And uh, in fact, uh, worked with a research institute um, the, uh, the Mersey Tobiatic Research Institute to see whether sustainably sourced FSC certified forestry operations could be a source uh, of wood heat for efficient wood heat for our community uh, while main that would allow those foresters to have a stable anchor tenant uh, or, or buyer for their wood while maintaining the quality of the forests. And in fact, the, uh, the results of that study were very interesting and could be uh, replicable in other parts of the province. So I would be pleased to share the results of that study with the panel if that was of interest. Um, another point that I would make is that um, uh, it is also possible for municipalities to enact commercial PACE programs, so PACE lending to uh, nonprofit organizations or businesses. That has not yet been done in the province, but there's technically no reason why it couldn't. One of the problems is that municipalities, it would be challenging under the current um, debt situation for municipalities to borrow the kind of money needed by um, commercial operations. And so that's not been done, but Bridgewater has actually t undertaken some studies to see how we might expand into commercial lending as well. Thank you. Ms. Chender for the NDP, please. Thank you. Um, I th so as the chair reminded us, we're talking about green jobs. It does seem like it's too bad that we don't have LAE here, actually, because I think some of these questions, as you mentioned, Mr. Dontremar, are best directed to them. But um, I do want to pick up a little bit uh, from what my colleague uh, Pat Dunn was asking, um, because certainly um, we know we have a great workforce here that those top scores uh, in Efficiency Canada's scorecard. But I think we also all know that if we want to meet um, the target of net zero by 2050, which, as my colleague Ms. Roberts said, is arguable if that's even fast enough, we need a massive influx of workers. <laughs> we need way more than we have. Um, I think the Clean Foundation um, Climate Leadership Program uh, was mentioned. Um, I My understanding is that that program needs to knock on the door of every department every year and ask for funding. So they were funded by LAE last year. They were not funded by LAE this year. They are getting funding somewhere else. Um, it would be nice if a program that's mentioned in these remarks that's recognized like that could have stable funding. Um, and I think, you know, that whether it's Clean Foundation or anyone else, um, I'm very hopeful, and we certainly will ask this question of the transition team, um, but, but I would ask you more broadly, um, but certainly with, with the backdrop of Northern Pulp in mind, um, around a mid-career a mid transition training program um, into the clean economy. Uh, and again, knowing the scale of 
the workforce that we will need. Um, so I guess um, knowing that you may not be able to answer those workforce specifics, I think this is mostly for the deputies, but whoever would like to chime in. My first question is, you know, what is the, what's the attack plan for government broadly on this question of green jobs? So again, just doing the basic math, if we want to get to this place, we know that these deep retrofits and, and other programs we're talking about are the best way to get there. What's the plan? Um, Ms. Martin. Uh, colleague Simone will um, uh, uh, chime in. As I, as I mentioned in my opening comments, um, uh, when we uh, uh, the legislation passed on sustainable development goals, uh, we committed at that time by the end of this year to uh, develop a plan to go with what are um, some very significant goals. The province has been the first to uh, commit to those in legislation. And uh, we'll be taking a very broad approach in, in that strategy, looking at um, a whole array of elements that are going to um, uh, allow this province to move forward and meet the goals by the, by the time they've laid out. Um, so that we'll be looking at um, opportunities um, uh, for businesses in Nova Scotia and the, and the role they would play. And we'll have a listening ear for um, what they would see as priorities. Um, uh, certainly on the uh, lot of commentary here on the uh, homeowner side of this in terms of, of uh, their energy needs and, and, and how we can improve there as well, um, as well as um, because we're broadly looking at climate change, looking at medi mitigation and adaptation. So um, it, it we'll be doing that, uh, starting that consultation in the spring um, and ensuring that um, that we have a listening ear for the, um, the for the various facets of the um, Nova Scotia uh, in terms of um, making sure that we build their comments in, into the plan. So, um, you know, from that plan, we'll have certainly the the detail and the um, and the specificity in terms of how we uh, ensure that uh, that we meet those goals. Mr. Dontremont. I, I think uh, uh, you're correct when you say that you know building human resources complement that we're in need. Uh, some estimates say we need a tripling of the workforce in this area. Every sector is going to be a little bit different. For us in the title sector, we didn't go out and train title people. We developed the incentives to attract the companies to come who then need to make sure they attract the skills to come with it to deliver. On the other hand, with the solar sector, we meet with the sector associations and ask them, what do you need to grow your sector? So on a sector, by same thing when we're talking about electrification of vehicles, we sit in a room and we're saying, okay, do we have the skill set needed of the mechanics to fix these types of vehicles? So on a sector by sector basis, we are having those conversations and coming up with individual strategies based on the different sector. As part of the climate action plan, for example, if we decide that building the human resources is, is, is a critical piece that's not going to happen organically by, by, you know, for the solar sector, we've developed the types of programming that make the companies come up and, and, and bring the people with them. So if those types of mechanics are not working and we need to organically ta tackle training of, of green sector employees, for example, then, you know, we'll look at that and that'll be one of our options we can consider to make it important pillars of our plans. Ms. Gender for a supplementary. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, I guess, you know, what I heard a little bit in Mr. DeVried's presentation and what I hear more generally is that, um, this is sort of antithetical <coughs> to some comments I made earlier today, but I think this is an area where we need real um, leadership. So certainly we need to listen to sectors and industry, but I think, you know, some major efforts and investments at the provincial level beyond just setting a target, um, but sort of funding the changes that need to happen um, are the only thing that will get us to where we need to be. Um, and so I, I'm, you know, I, I think that's sounds, all sounds good, uh, Mr. Dontremont, you know, meeting with all those various sectors. Um, but again, we know that there are programs out there that are working, um, that are working because of the innovation of a single town or even a single person, or are working because 
of you know nonprofit employees who are just knocking on your doors, you know, five times a year and saying, please, 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 please fund us, and that's great. But um, but I guess you know I know we have like a social deputies table, for instance. Is there a similar effort happening? around the greening of the economy. So how are the folks at your level uh, working together to ensure that we take the big moves we need to take um, to get to achieve these targets? Ms. Martin. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, we, um, uh, you mentioned um, LAE, for example, um, Environment and Energy. Um, uh, uh, collaborate um, uh, quite significantly um, on the development of the climate change plan. Um, uh, absolutely, there's um, a table of, of deputies that will be there um, to ensure that we comprehensively cover cover all the bases that we will need to. Um, uh, Energy is there. LAE will be there. Um, and I guess just in, in response to my um, earlier comments, uh, you made a point around funding. Um, we do have the advantage in Nova Scotia where we have a cap and trade system. Uh, we will be um, doing uh, some trading, uh, actively um, implementing that cap and trade system. Um, first trade will be in June of, of this year. Um, that will provide us with, um, uh, so, you know, a significant share of uh, funding to uh, invest in, um, you know, everything from research and development to uh, implementation and, and innovation in, in various sectors. So uh, I feel that we're well organized and, and equipped and uh, in this case even we'll have access to funding to ensure that um, the plan that uh, we develop uh, gets us uh, to the goals. Mr. Dantramont. Just a quick add-on as well. The federal government announced $100 million for green sector training, as, as we mentioned. And, uh, you know, the, the fortuitous alignment of that in a climate action plan is a great time to come up with a plan before you go ask for any funding. But I just want to pass on an interesting example of when you go ask your partners questions, you get, you, you know, none of us are smart as all of us. We approach the community college and say, we're funding some solar programs. Why don't we train some people, for example, we're installing, we're going to do home energy retrofits on, on many First Nations homes. And we said, why don't we train people solar installers? And the community college wisely said, well, if you train a solar installer, when they show up at a home, the only thing they're going to recommend is solar. And sometimes it's, it's not solar, it's something else. You need to train energy advisors to have the full suite of the types of tools they have. So, you know, these are the types of learnings we're making by engaging our partners. And when we come up with plans, we'll come up with better plans. Anyone else? Oh, oh, Mr. DeVry. Uh, thank you. Um, there's actually already a significant amount of capital available within Nova Scotia to do the work that needs to be done. Uh, if you would permit me to move to my uh, one, one more slide Certainly. here. Around funding and partnerships, one of the initiatives that we are trying to uh, work into the Energize Bridgewater program is the idea that existing federal and provincial funding programs may actually be able to work together using existing resources to enable deep energy retrofits. And I'll just provide a, a very basic example. When it comes to low income programs in the province, there is millions and millions already being spent to provide housing, income supplements, and so on for folks who, in many cases, are living in highly energy inefficient housing. One of the challenges that we have, if we were to really focus our deep energy retrofits on low income housing stock, is to get over uh, basically deferred capital spending on this housing stock. The housing stock is aging, it's, it's leaky, it often needs renovations beyond just energy retrofits. So if you were to try to apply energy retrofits to these homes, they're often not possible because of the large amount of deferred maintenance in the home or the apartment building. Our proposal is that provincial and federal departments work together to coordinate strategic spending on low income housing stock to take care of the deferred maintenance load so that then financing programs can deal with the energy load. So by stacking existing resources 
with private capital, we can actually overcome this major, major roadblock in putting much needed money into our most needed, most needy uh, housing sector. We are very keen to work with provincial departments and department heads to figure out this, the, the mechanisms through which that can work. And we would like to present Bridgewater as a, as a pilot community where that takes place. But it will require departments to think a little bit out of the box in how, program is, is how programs fund um, uh, housing initiatives. But we are very keen to make that solution work. And we think it's necessary. Mr. Dantemont, you have something more to add? Uh, we agree in terms of the, the policy situation that we have uh, in that uh, low income are often our highest emitting greenhouse gas per capita. Housing have the least ability because of energy poverty to do anything about it. So uh, within the last few months, we've announced $22 million for home uh, for energy refits uh, at, uh, at Housing Nova Scotia Housing. Uh, we're going to do that over the next four years. So we agree it's something that needs to get done, and we'll keep our eyes peeled for opportunities to do more. Thank you. We'll move on to the Liberal Caucus. Mr. McGuire. One second. I'm sending a text. To Housing Nova Scotia. <laughs> Not even joking. Uh, okay. So here we go. Um, I, 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 I want to get into some of the details here. Uh, so obviously uh, the future, you know, we talked about the importance of uh, energy efficiency and things like that, and and we've heard the reasons why, whether it's the green economy and things like that. And for me, probably the most important reason for me, aside from the environment, is like I have three children, so it's it's time to put up or shut up, really, for me. Um, I, I do. I want to get down to some of the numbers because I hear a lot of numbers, and I'm looking at Mr. McDonald in particular because you floated a few numbers around, and I just want to understand the numbers because a lot of times, so a lot of times we hear numbers. And there's, they're, they're just that. They're just statistics. They're just numbers. So, like, some of the stuff you said was, like, for every $1 spent in energy, um, there's $7 in GDP. Um, and that the green economy and the jobs coming out of the green economy is the way of the future. So we hear this all the time. So I'm going to ask you to educate me right now. I'd like to know where these numbers come from, what they really actually mean. And I know, so, and this is a... This is a positive problem to have. One of the issues that we're facing right now around solar is uh, if you if you uh, go through Efficiency Nova Scotia, and I, I personally went through, and I have solar panels on my house now, and I, uh, it took a little over a year to get from the process to beginning to, to the installation. It's actually taking a lot longer now, and it has nothing to do actually with the program. It's more of the installers. So. Uh, I have a friend who lives down the street who's had the racks on his roof now for about 18 months waiting for the installers to come in and unfortunately because of weather and because of all and just because of uh, labor they just can't do it so this was there's I have one other question for this group but for you I, I need to understand this where you come up with the one dollar spent because if I went to the oil industry they would say well for every dollar spent you're going to give me you know, so everybody has his numbers. I just want to know where that m number comes from, what it means. The jobs that are going to be created in the green economy, uh, are they short-term jobs? Are they long-term sustainable jobs? So that way, when I go up to the public and advocate for this stuff, I'm not, you know, like, I'm educated on this, or as educated as you're going to give me right now. Mr. McDonald, can you do that? <laughs> I'll, I'll see what I can do. So, um, so there's a couple of questions, a uh, couple of questions there. So um, first is around the numbers that I quoted in my opening remarks. So. Um, the $1, um, every $1 spent in energy efficiency results in uh, $7 in GDP. That comes from a Dunsky Energy Consulting study that they did on um, if uh, Canada was to implement measures under the Pan-Canadian framework. And so that framework included a certain level of energy efficiency. So generally with energy efficiency, why it has such a positive impact on the economy, there's a number of reasons. One, um, savings from the energy itself. And so uh, when you're not spending money on energy, you're spending it on something else. And generally, studies, um, some coming from Dunsky, like the one I referenced, some coming out of the US, generally those studies have shown that uh, the money that's saved on energy costs is put into higher um, output activities. And so um, you can think about when you pay your electric bill, regardless of what jurisdiction you're in, you know that money goes to electricity utility, maybe it 
goes in some cases to buy the fuel, the coal, the natural gas, whatever it is. That's not always produced locally in the economy. With energy efficiency, when you spend that money, and I think Leon did a good job of explaining in his presentation, when you spend that money, you're spending it locally. And so that when the person is uh, selling you that um, heat pump, they're doing insulation in your home, electrician is coming to you know, do some rewiring at your business or whatever, these are, these are local people and they're across the province. And so the spending happens locally, not out of province, has a greater impact on the economy. So those are kind of the general reasons why the, you know, there's such a big impact from spending on energy efficiency. The types of jobs, and so whether short-term, long-term, uh, in my view, they are long-term jobs. And if we're going to um, meet some of the goals that we've set out and we've talked about getting to net zero by 2050 or really making that you know, um, aggressive change that's required to address climate change, these jobs have to be long-term. Um, the amount of effort required and the amount of opportunity that's there through energy efficiency means that these jobs uh, should be long-term in nature. The types of jobs, they really run a wide spectrum. And so you think about people who do design of buildings. Building design is going to be incredibly important to getting towards deep energy retrofits. Um, you think about people uh, installing HVAC equipment in commercial enterprises, right? In some cases, very technical equipment training. You think about electricians. You think about um, uh, laborers who might be installing insulation. Uh, think of energy advisors, energy auditors. So they have to be specially trained and knowledgeable on the use of energy, building design, those things. So it's quite a wide range of jobs, and in my view, they need to be long-term in nature. And i just add one uh, final point. Go ahead. Um, and, that's on the, um, um, and that's on how to mobilize this workforce, if you will. One of the things that we have found is that when you're able to give the industry certainty around a particular market, that allows them to invest. And so uh, much of the funding that the, the province um, has worked with us on has been for multi-year contracts. Uh, our work through the electricity system is a minimum of three years. That provides some certainty to the industry that they can invest in people, that they can invest in equipment, they can invest in training. I think that's hugely important to mobilizing the workforce and getting companies to make investments in this sector. Mr. McGuire, for your supplementary. Thank you for that. And I'm glad that you kind of you touched on uh, buildings and large infrastructure projects because my next question was for uh, the Deputy of Environment and the Deputy for Energy and Mines. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, huge infrastructure projects that are happening around the province uh, and will happen in going forward. Uh, is, is your department working with, whether it's twinning of highways, whether it's, uh, you know, building hospitals or building schools and things like that, are you working with the Department of Transportation, which is usually always the lead on this, uh, and putting a energy efficiency and an environmental lens on these projects? Uh, because, you know, we're spending, in some cases, billions of dollars on some of this stuff. And, and uh, this, this infrastructure, you know, we use, a, I'll just use a school, for example, like the school in my community. Will, I know that probably in my lifetime, I probably won't see another brand new high school built in the community. So for me, it's a once in a generation thing. We want to make sure that, you know, five years from now or 10 years from now, we're not looking back at that and saying, holy hell, who built this thing, right? Like, is there going to be a, are you working with them to put a green lens on these projects? Ms. Martin, do you want to start? Sure. Yeah, sure. So uh, I, I guess uh, just a couple of things that I would um, identify as um, a variety of large projects that we do, um, not necessarily TIR projects, but large projects in this province, the ones that are subject to environmental assessment, um, all of our environmental assessments would have a climate change lens on them. So that's where we have an opportunity to look at um, some of those uh, sorts of features that, that you referred to. Um, we, I talked earlier quite a bit about um, the new climate change plan that we'll um, start work on uh, this spring and conclude by the end of the year. Um, uh, it, it, we do have an existing climate change plan, um, and under that plan, uh, we worked with a whole variety of, of departments. Um, you know, agriculture would be one. Uh, TIR certainly certainly was one as well. And um, as a matter of the course of uh, them uh, doing their work now, they, they abide by a variety of different energy efficient um, uh, standards uh, built into their, the work that they do day in and day out on various projects. Um, and uh, certainly uh, we'll be engaging them as we continue to do, to do the work um, 
this uh, uh, spring and, and for the remainder of this year, basically, um, on the development of a new climate action plan. Mr. Dontremont. Uh, under the federal infrastructure program, there is a green component. Uh, so we, the Department of Energy and Mines, have access to $171 million for, for uh, infrastructure projects that will reduce the impact uh, uh, of the energy sector on climate change, but also the federal government, because they're uh, of, of the mind of the climate change impact, they have a climate change lens on the projects, even the non-green projects under our stream, the other types of projects they fund, they do have a climate change lens on it. So if you were, I don't know how well, how it applies, but if you were asking the federal government for infrastructure funding to do something that was contributing negatively to climate change, I'm quite confident you would not be supported. And the types of projects that do, through their mechanisms, advance the agenda, I'm sure, are getting, uh, getting a higher score. Mr. Dunn for the PC Caucus. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just And this question may be for uh, Mr. Dontremont. I'm just thinking of uh, all the buildings across the province uh, that the province owns uh, across uh, Nova Scotia. I assume that uh, several of them might be energy inefficient. Uh, so just a few comments maybe going forward. Uh, what, what exactly are we doing with the buildings that we do own? And I'm not, I'm not talking about new ones that are going to occur, but the ones that are already there. Mr. Dontremont. Sure. I can jump in. Uh, we are starting to do some work on, you know, we need to understand Nova Scotia's climate change footprint, especially as we head into work, working with our partners in uh, an environment on a climate change action plan, we need to look about what about the greening the operations of the province of Nova Scotia. It needs to be part of that analysis. So we're starting to do some analysis, for example, on, on what are electricity costs. The federal government made a commitment to go 100% non-emitting sources of electricity by 2025. They've now sped that up to 2022. Thanks very much. But uh, you know, do we want to make that same type of commitment as a province of Nova Scotia to be 100% non-emitting by some future point? Do we want to look at electrification of our fleet over time? Of course, that's not something you can snap on a dime. We have trucks that go far. We have snow plows that you know, I'm sure electric motor and a snow plow is going to be a challenge. So uh, we need to look at electrification of our own fleet. And we need to look at our own building footprint. We spend you know, $8 million on electricity every year. Can we reduce that cost by the greening of our own, of our own building stock and so on? So I, I think one of the key questions as working on the Climate Action Plan is what do we do? And do we use strategic procurement of our procurement power as a province to drive the types of investments, either supporting companies, buying products that have a certain lens? These are all questions we need to ask ourselves heading into the Climate Change Action Plan work to figure out what, what can we do looking in our own mirror. Mr. Dunn, for your supplementary. Oh, sorry, Mr. McDonald, go ahead. Thank you. One of the programs that uh, we offer um, that's in part funded by the Department of Energy and Mines uh, is something called our On-Site Energy Manager Program. Uh, this is a program where we will embed a specially trained individual to help organizations uh, with their energy efficiency projects. Town of Bridgewater, has uh, participated in this program, um, but two uh, on-site energy managers we have are embedded with the province itself, and so uh, with our hospitals and with Housing Nova Scotia. And so we had some uh, talk earlier about the, um, the important need that's uh, with low-income housing stock. Um, uh, these are really impactful programs, having someone on-site who has knowledge about all of our programs but it's their dedicated job every day to focus on energy efficiency. And we've found uptake in this program to be hugely impactful. And uh, those are just two examples where the province has participated. So, and I think made a lot of progress. Mr. Dunn. Thank you, Madam Chair. The uh, last question, like, I, I know around my community, uh, there's uh, a lot of um, uh, newly built rentals going up. Uh, a lot of people moving out of their homes into these rentals, and there's the number is significant. And I guess my question is, uh, with with so many of these uh, going up, is there, there there must be a efficiency standard for them? If you want to, if someone wants to comment on that, in the in the building building code. Uh, Ms. Martin. Sure. Uh, sure. Go, uh, I guess uh, just uh, that would uh, be building code driven. And I know um, 
uh, in our conversations at the Canadian Council of Environment Ministers as we discuss uh, climate change, uh, building code uh, comes up in those discussions. Uh, at the national level, they have the opportunity to influence um, what is um, how that code is innovated to um, uh, ensure that um, the efficiency standards are, are progressing. Um, and um, so, so just a few comments there on the national level. Nancy may have other comments to supplement. Ms. Rondell. Yeah, I can just um, update on the federal building code changes that are um, being proposed right now. So they're out for consultation. And the proposal is that by 2030, all new homes will be new and larger buildings will be net zero ready by 2030. Um, so the federal government is proposing a, a new building code for 2020 that would have uh, that would be adopted by provinces and would have different phases of, of uh, energy performance. And so provinces would decide whether their industry is ready and at what stage of the building code or what step in the building code they'd be ready to implement. So that is something that um, our colleagues at Municipal Affairs um, are, are looking at. Thank you. We'll turn it over to the NDP caucus. Ms. Roberts. Thank you. Um, I want to take us back to the conversation about affordable housing for, uh, for a moment. Um, and uh, I know that there is an Efficiency Nova Scotia program that ties investment in inefficiency to guaranteed rental rates. Um, in order to ensure that energy savings from retrofits um, are passed on to tenants. The schedule attached to this program requires, for example, that a one-bedroom apartment in HRM whose rent includes heat and electricity uh, charges a maximum rent of $867 for the first year of the program. But we know that right now the average one-bedroom in Halifax is at $959 a month. So um, I'm, I guess my question is how are we ensuring or how are you ensuring that this program can be deployed to many units and, and that rents are protected? Mr. McDonald. Thank you. Uh, so in terms of um, deployment of the program, um, our view is that with the current funding available for that program, uh, there's still sufficient need in the marketplace and opportunity to, to get buildings with rents in that level. Um, in terms of how we um, assure that the rents don't increase, we do ask uh, landlords, building owners to lock in the rents for up to a 12-year period. Um, we ask them to sign an agreement with us not to do that. Um, we're still very much in the early, um, I'll say early days, but the program has only been around for a couple of years. And so obviously for a program like this to really assess its effectiveness, we have to have a few more years in the marketplace to see how landlords respond. Um, but that's the primary way in which we encourage landlords not to uh, increase rent. The other part of this I would mention is that um, renters are, uh, as you know, um, a very difficult market to uh, get at in terms of energy efficiency. In many cases, uh, the landlord and billing owner uh, does not pay the electricity bill. It's paid by the tenant. And so in many cases, the billing owner is not necessarily incented or motivated to um, do energy efficiency upgrades because the savings aren't being passed on or aren't being accrued by them. And so what we found for this program is that it requires a higher level of incentive offering, higher than, uh, say, a normal uh, program, if you will, but also uh, more marketing and encouragement to the building owners to encourage them to participate in the program. Mr. Dontremont. This issue of helping lower income Nova Scotians achieve their own climate change ambitions is something that we're thinking about at the Department of Energy and Mines. Our, the simplest form of arranging our programming often is to attribute it to home ownership. And through home ownership, you have more access. The, the, the programs are biased and weighted towards higher incomes because home ownership is often a rite of passage into the programming. But we're doing some thinking about this. We're trying to think up of some innovative ways whereby lower income people could participate through their ambition in climate change ambition. An example might be a solar garden, which you would establish a solar farm but then every solar panel could be owned virtually by a renter who would you know, virtually own one of those solar panels and get an incentive based on their home bill for their participation on one solar panel out of a solar farm. An interesting social aspect of this is a great place to put a solar farm is on a contaminated site where no one else wants to put anything and a contaminated site actually has this high proportion of being next door to an economically disadvantaged 
communities through some form of, some of you know, economic discrimination. So wouldn't it be great if we can figure out a mechanism to set up these types of like things like solar farms next door to economically disadvantaged communities and give them a virtual mechanism of participating in the benefits of that, even though they're not a homeowner. So we are thinking about these types of things and trying to figure out how to establish processes and mechanisms that might help them happen in the future. Ms. Roberts, for you supplementary. Thank you. Uh, thank you for those answers. Um, the Ecology Action Centre has outlined a scenario for deep retrofits to 100% of eligible social housing by 2030. Um, are there any plans at the, at the department to implement, to use that recommendation? Mr. Dontemont? Not in such a direct way, but as I mentioned, we've made a commitment that we announced $22 million over four years to housing Nova Scotia, low-income housing. And we've made a commitment in the next 10 years to retrofit uh, every First Nations home in Nova Scotia, which, uh, which is also in terms of their per capita emission of you know, carbon intensity is, is quite high. So, you know, very proud of that work uh, that we're doing. I'm sure we'll keep our, our eyes open for more opportunity to do more. We'll turn it over to the Liberal Caucus. Ms. Arab. Thank you, Madam Chair. And actually, through you, I'm going to ask some questions that sort of build on what Ms. Roberts was uh, asking as well. Um, and I guess my first would be to Mr. McDonald because he briefly um, spoke about incentives. So Fairview Clayton Park, the area that I represent, is one of the fastest growing uh, there isn't a lot of land, so most of that is growing up. So it's apartments, it's condominiums. Um, I'm not aware, when I speak to developers about why they aren't doing more to have um, efficient buildings, um, they say that the cost is too high. So I guess my the first part of my question would be, what are the programs and what are the incentives to developers to make their buildings um, more efficient Mr. for their tenants? Mr. McDonald. Thank you. Uh, we have a program um, for construction of new uh, multi-unit residential buildings, apartment condos that provide incentive to increase the efficiency of the building envelope, increase the efficiency of the heating and cooling systems they include in the buildings and other things. Um, incentives um, will depend on um, how far the developer or the building owner goes in terms of their energy efficiency. Um, incentives can reach as much as $500,000. That would be um, that would be at the very top end of incentives. Most wouldn't be coming in around that area. Um, so it's hard to give an exact number, you know, you get this for this, but, um, but we do have programs to encourage um, building higher efficiency buildings. Thank you. Ms. Zareb. Thank you, Madam Chair. So as, as a follow-up, a 500,000 top-off doesn't really compare to what homeowners are eligible for. So I guess it would be a com whoever would like to take this. Uh, for, for me, um, again, when you're representing an area that has a high density, which a lot of the HRM members do have, we want uh, we have uh, residents who want to take part in programs, but either the condo that they own is not fitted, not, not, it's not possible, or they're a renter, so there isn't incentives for them. So what, if anything, are we looking at in terms of making that, that in, um, that incentive for developers higher, or at least more comparable to what a resident, me as a homeowner, would be able to be eligible for. Mr. McDonald. Thank you. Um, so uh, uh, I, sh I should start with incentives we have available for homeowners. And so for the construction of uh, new homes, um, incentives are available, available up to $7,000. Um, and that's um, building to a certain standard above code. Um, and we also have a program funded by the Department of Energy and Mines to incent the uh, building of uh, to net zero or passive house standard. And so that would increase the total incentive available to $9,000 for a homeowner. And so just to give the context around the homeowner numbers, um, for condo um, builders of condo um, units, uh, rental units, as I said, we do have incentives programs available to encourage um, building of efficient uh, buildings. Um, we, we do find often um, there's a, quite a marketing component in addition to just the financial incentives available. And so working with developers to encourage them to make that choice. Um, there will come a point in time, and I know there are discussions happening, Ms. Rondeau mentioned that, around uh, amending building codes. And so uh, our work at Efficiency Nova Scotia is to try and encourage the market to adopt energy efficiency technologies and practices 
And once the market starts to change, those get adopted into building codes. And um, oftentimes, the code will get updated uh, as people start to adopt these practices. And so um, at some point in time with condo uh, developers, the building code will need to change to keep pace. And I believe that's part of um, discussions that are happening in this Rondo outlined earlier, so. Okay, we have time for one more round. Two quick questions or one question? Are we able to go with two quick questions? Okay, um, Ms. Smith McCrossan. Thank you. Um, I love what Bridgewater's doing, so hats off. I think you guys are real leaders here in the province and love to see more of what you're doing province-wide because um, one of the things that really stands out to me at the beginning of the presentation was the fact that Nova Scotia is ranked third in the country when it comes to energy po poverty and that what that means, what that, what does that statistic actually mean? It means that over 150,000 um, households in Nova Scotia are living in energy poverty and, and struggling day to day. Um, I'm also, you know, burdened with what's happening within our forestry sector. So my question to you is, um, will the province be willing to create a provincial strategy create a provincial strategy that would dramatically reduce energy poverty in the province of Nova Scotia and include our forestry sector in that strategy, considering that forestry is a renewable energy source. And that's for anyone who would like. Who would like to take mm -hmm. that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Ms. Martin. Yes, uh, so uh, I, I had mentioned earlier that uh, we'll be working this um, uh, spring and summer, uh, actually the year of 2019, on the uh, development of the uh, climate, change, uh, climate Change Action Plan. Um, and um, I had mentioned uh, we work closely with, with energy on it, um, uh, transportation and infrastructure renewal, uh, LA on the... Um, on the labor side, but we will also be working closely with uh, lands and forestry. In fact, we're collaborating a fair amount with, with them now um, on various aspects of, of climate change, and um, so I, I would expect that we would have um, you know ongoing conversations there and more detail developing as we uh, carry out our consultation and conclude our, our plan. Okay, Mr. Dontremont. Sure. Uh, I, I think back to the energy poverty question, our, our, uh, one of our main policy mechanisms to address that is what I mentioned earlier, the home, the home warming program, where we, have, we spend $12 million a year providing low-income energy efficiency activity delivered by, by Housing Nova Scotia, uh, sorry, by Efficiency Nova Scotia, again, making a, a difference between power rates and what your actual bill is by, you know, uh, and the average impact on that is $950 per year per home. So we're doing that. We're also looking at other, you know, uh, 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 policies, including uh, opportunities for small district uh, wood heat opportunities for, you know, public buildings and these types of things. These things have been done in places like Prince Edward Island where they do, you know, public buildings are heated by, by uh, wood chips and so on. So we're looking at all those opportunities to see how they can participate in, in our energy future. Ms. smith McCrossin. Quickly. I'll, Quickly. I'll just ask, um, so with respects to your last uh, point, um, you mentioned earlier there was $171 million through the federal government to for climate change initiatives. If something, say, like the federal prison in Spring Hill was, was willing to be part of moving to a district heating system, that we're, we're estimating would use about 25, 30 th tons of wood uh, or, or pulp a year. Would that qualify for some of that federal climate change money? Mr. Dontemont? Without knowing for sure, but I expect that it's a federal asset. So they would have to self-fund that or it would be up to them to decide whether or not they want to use some of their infrastructure funding on their own assets. The types of funding that we have access to, you know, we wouldn't, fund federal infrastructure as our as our top priority and I'm expecting it's it's either not eligible or some version thereof that it would be up to the federal government to invest in their own assets. Okay, thank you. Ms. Roberts for the NDP caucus. 
Thank you. Um, it's been great to have so many uh, different players here at the table, but one player that's not here is Nova Scotia Power. Um, and I am, uh, you know, re hearing and seeing uh, frustration from various quarters at the, the limits placed by, uh, by Nova Scotia Power on solar installations. Um, Give you give you an example of a, a church in my neighborhood that has a wonderful large south facing roof, and they looked at installing solar panels on it, but they are currently on an oil fired uh, furnace, and basically they don't use a lot of they don't use a lot of electricity, and therefore uh, it it just doesn't make economic sense to put in all the energy to install one solar panel or two solar panels on a roof that could maybe take 25. Um, and I, I'm seeing this on, on Twitter, various comments. And so I guess maybe I'll, I'll go first to, um, to Mr. DeReed on, on this question. I'm wondering, in the implementation of, of Bridgewater's work, um, has Nova Scotia power been a supportive or, or has have there been barriers as it kind of... I think it's being perceived as protecting its business. Mr. DeVee. Uh, yeah, so uh, Nova Scotia Power has certainly been a partner in our um, design and implementation of our plans. Um, you know, as, as, the, as the main provincial utility, obviously there are vested interests in, uh, in their economic model as well as limitations imposed on Nova Scotia Power by the UARB. And so, um, you know, working with uh, utilities for, especially for small municipalities, is inherently kind of a complicated process. Uh, what we, what I can speak to is that uh, uh, conversations are ongoing. Uh, we have been meeting with uh, some of the, the senior leadership at Nova Scotia Power uh, for the past year or more. And so, and we've also had uh, some of the uh, folks at this table in the room uh, at those conversations as well, where there is, uh, discussion about, you know, it, it. The way that I would frame it is, you know, what's the next, what's the next thing in community-based um, uh, distributed energy resources? You know, community solar farms and so on. Like, how can how can municipalities and uh, the utilities work together on that? Um, I don't know where the road will lead, um, but it's certainly a very important road. Um, that has to be walked. You know, if Nova Scotia had a, um, a strong plan for the complete decarbonization of its electricity system, then communities may not need to go to great lengths to do additional, to put in place additional incentives to decarbonize their own community infrastructure, right? But in the absence of, it, it, with, with, a, with a provincial um, energy system that will only decarbonize up to a certain point, at least in you know, the planning that has been enacted and so on to date, um, it's really incumbent on communities to find other decarbonization solutions. Some of those involve working with utilities. And if utilities would put those solutions on the table, then communities may take advantage of those. Um, if utilities are not willing to put those on the table, then communities may be looking for other creative out-of-the-box solutions, but may also be hampered by the utility space around them. So it's, it's, a, it's a complex process of trying to figure out the, the way forward that offers the best value for a community, the best equity, right, for its, its, its marginalized community members, the best economic, um, uh, approach um, and and a feasible regulatory approach as well. Um, I'm pleased to say that you know many of our provincial partners are working together and the utility with us right now to explore what's possible for a community that really wants to push the envelope on this. Um, but it's 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 certainly not clear at this time yet where where this is going to end up. Um, and I I would say that there is absolutely rule, room for innovation. Uh, both legislatively and from a regulatory perspective, as well as in the utility sector. Um, Mr. Dantemont, do you want to quickly add? <laughs> sure. 
Uh, I think, you know, uh, as has been mentioned, if you look at greenhouse gases in Nova Scotia, 40% comes from heating oil and gasoline, 40% from the energy system, and 10% uh, from everyone else. So if we're going to make a difference uh, in that, obviously, uh, decarbonizing our electricity system is going to be important, and electrifying things like heating oil and, and, and vehicles will clearly be another path. Both of those paths are, are through electrification, but that strategy to reduce greenhouse gases only works if you decarbonize and bend the curve of carbon going forward. Of course, we've been doing that. We've got a 40% renewable energy standard that we're going to meet. Next year, we're going to flip the switch on the maritime link, and we're going to bring in 20% of our energy from hydro in one, in one flick of the switch. We're going to increase our renewables up to 60%. And we've made the most, we've started in a hard place and we've made the most progress from 2005 levels than every, any place in the country. And we've made a 53% reduction target, the most aggressive in the country as well, to continue to decarbonize. So, so that electrification can be a good path to improving our, our, our impact uh, uh, from, from our energy systems on greenhouse gases. Because again, electrification only works if you have decarbonization along that. So we've set some paths, we've got some policies around cap and trade and our 53% goals, our renewable energy standard, and we will continue to bend that curve down to make sure that we get uh, where, where Nova Scotians' aspirations are. Okay, Ms. Roberts for a quick supplementary. I think I, I'm, I'm mostly just gonna uh, take the moment to thank Bridgewater for, I guess, forcing us to walk down that path, because it really strikes me how incredibly valuable that is, given that there aren't, there aren't multiple municipalities, you know, I, I'm, I'm the municipal affairs critic for the NDP, and, and we put so much on our municipalities, and for, for you to do that hard work on behalf of communities across the province is just incredibly valuable, but it also um, strikes me as, as deeply kind of wrong um, that that we're in a position with, um, you know, a privatized monopoly uh, electricity provider that is not itself walking that path and really and really, you know, leading us. Um, and and I'm not privy to those conversations, but it strikes me that like a year and a half of you know, a year and a half of meetings uh, with a power utility and a municipality and call, calling in provincial, uh, you know, department allies, that, that is a lot of human resources to tie up and trying to, and trying to work with, um, with and around those vested interests. And, and as someone who can, you know, see the, the pipes of Tufts Cove um, from my neighborhood, yeah, we still have a, we still have a ways to go. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move over for our last set of questions from the uh, Liberal Caucus. Mr. Jessam. Thank you, Madam Chair. Through you to one or some of our guests here today, um, appreciating the variety of programs that uh, Nova Scotians have access to um, and with the understanding that uptake and access to these programs, successful access to these programs is uh, of is of a significant priority for everybody. I think that's a fair assessment here today. Um, what is being done to ensure that the support that's out there through our departments, through our our arms length organizations, uh, to get Nova Scotians to a, a successful application? Um, has there been any changes? made recently to, um, I think Mr. Mr. Don Tremont alluded to uh, a group he referred to as energy advisors. Um, you know, we, if we want people to take on these initiatives uh, and at times perhaps government can receive a reputation of saying no too much, so how do we ensure that if someone comes banging on our door wanting to do something towards this goal, um, how do we ensure that they walk away with the yes? Mr. Duncan I'll just take the opportunity to give some a, a shout out to uh, Steve and his organization. Uh, I, they've got a great reputation from all the, the circles that I've traveled in terms of their ability to deliver good programming, to be able to pre-qualify installers, give people confidence. Uh, and I, I have to say I'm impressed with their ability 
Uh, as you mentioned, the, the, the ratings we've gotten from national organizations show that we're, we, we're not holding second fiddle to, playing second fiddle to anyone in terms of the, the great work they're doing. But I have to give a shout out to the way that they measure their work. When they come back to us and tell us what they've been up to, very metrics based. They know how many people they're seeing, how many people they're delivering, what their goals are for the quarter, whether or not they've met them. And I think through that discipline, if we start falling off and, and not doing a good job, we're going to know. And I think that that's the, 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 you know, the, the best way we make sure we're staying on track. Mr. Jessam, for a quick supplementary. Yeah, I would just, uh, I guess, offer that the relationship that my office has had with efficiency has been extremely positive, and uh, certainly from an information uh, relaying perspective, I've always um, had access to what is required, and I think it's been of benefit to constituents that I've engaged on this subject. Uh, I'm wondering. Again, with that that emphasis placed on uh, successful applications and making it easy to access these programs, uh, is there an appetite or a thought towards kind of like a universal intake uh, in partnership with municipalities and the federal government? Mr. McDonald? Th thank you. So we're always looking for ways that we can improve uh, ease of use and accessibility of our programs. And so over the years, since I've been involved with this, uh, we've made a number of changes, whether that's online application forms, you know, moving away from paper and other things or pre-qualification. And uh, there's lots more uh, work that can be done in that area. So, you know, thinking in terms of like apps you can have or scanning your receipts and sending that to us. So um, we're always looking for ways that we can improve that. Um, I mentioned earlier in some of my remarks that the federal government has been talking about introducing some low interest loans for energy efficiency upgrades, um, providing free audits. Um, we want to make sure we create a scenario where Nova Scotians uh, don't have to worry about who they should contact or call or how to figure out programs. Um, uh, I haven't spent a lot of time today talking about the unique model that's in place in Nova Scotia for energy efficiency, but it is a unique model. And so to have a single administrator that's independent of the electricity utility, independent of government, is pretty unique. We're the only um, uh, province in Canada that has that model, and other than Vermont, uh, is the only jurisdiction in North America that I'm aware of that has that type of model. And when the province... Um, uh, asks us to go out and upgrade a certain number of low-income homes or provide services to renters or help Mi'kmaq communities or the UARB asks us to focus on our electricity energy efficiency work. All of that work is associated with targets and our work uh, revolves around achieving certain number of energy savings targets and we're very focused on that and I think that's hardwired into the model and I think one of the reasons why um, you know we've been able to have the kind of success we have but any opportunity we have to streamline programs and make it more accessible and easier for Nova Scotians, we're always striving for that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have closing remarks by anyone, any of our presenters? Mr. McDonald? Thank you, if there's time. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, look, thanks uh, so much uh, for the committee's time today. Um, I would like to leave you with a few takeaways. And so um, the first is what I just spoke about, and that's the model for energy efficiency here in Nova Scotia. So it's independent, it's target-based, it's performance-based, uh, uh, and it does have a track record of success. Um, it's a model that I'm very confident that can be used to achieve even greater greenhouse gas emission reductions in the province. Um, it's something the province has taken advantage of, and I think there's more of an opportunity as we look to where greenhouse gas uh, emission reductions can come from to take advantage of this really unique model. The second is, um, uh, and we have mentioned it, energy efficiency is um, it, it's a fast, cost-effective way for individuals, businesses, nonprofit organizations, and communities uh, to save money by reducing their energy costs um, while also reducing their climate impact. Um, and it really should be the first choice for policymakers as the most cost-effective way to achieve climate change targets. Um, Mr. Dantramal mentioned uh, a path towards uh, electrification, particularly as the electricity system becomes one based on renewable sources. Uh, from a customer perspective, and the actual people paying that electricity uh, usage, that becomes a much easier transition, a much more affordable transition, um, in my view, a much more equitable transition if energy efficiency 
comes first, reducing and becoming more efficient on the energy you use as part of that transition. Um, and the third point I would, would um, leave the committee with is that um, you, you know it's often uh, common or has been common in the past for the economy and the environment to be seen um, and positioned as a choice between the two, um, a trade-off, if you will. Um, well, the robust and, and growing energy efficiency industry and its significant contribution to climate change um, is one of the best, if not the best in my view, example of how the economy and the environment can go hand in hand. Thank well, you. Thank you. Um, this has been a most interesting uh, meeting. I thank each of you for coming. I see Mr. Gorman has, is warming up his microphone. I'm sure he'll like to ca capture some of you for an interview. And uh, we're, we'll let you go, and we're just going to wrap up with our business meeting. Thank you very much. <laughs>